there's a lot of um, uh, diff varying opinions about what is analytics, and what I've uh, put up here is uh, a definition. It's rather lengthy that, that I use. Um, essentially, in case not, your your screen is partly blocked, let me read this for you. Analytics is the discovery and communication of meaningful patterns and data. It makes use of information, statistics, and mathematical algorithms to develop knowledge, to quantify performance, or to make predictions. It uses the insights from this process to recommend action or to guide decision making. Analytics is best thought of as, an, as a research procedure for decision making, not simply as isolated tools or steps uh, in a process. Okay. Right, moving to the next slide. Um, there are, as you can see, many steps uh, in analytics. There are many components. So today we're just going to have time to briefly touch on, on model building. Uh, they're, they're all important. Uh, arguably uh, the first and the last, defining objectives and uh, really how the results of the research are used are, are most important. But they're all important in their own little way. There are a whole bunch of ways, countless ways really, that we can analyze data and there are many, many things that we have in our our toolkits, so they're descriptive and exploratory analysis, they're models that predict, they're causal models. There's analysis of cross-sectional data, there's analysis of longitudinal or time series data, they're models with quantitative dependent variables, they're models with categorical dependent variables, they're time to event models. They're models of group variables, like factor analysis. There are methods that group cases, such as cluster analysis. There's text mining, and there's simulations and forecasts. Now, the size and the type of the data we're analyzing obviously is going to have some impact on our choice of tools. However, perhaps the, the size of the data itself is less important than a lot of the big data hype uh, might suggest. Uh, some marketing researchers have been using uh, and working with very, very large data sets for many, many years. And, and so it's not exact, big data is not exactly brand new. Uh, at least the way the term is very often used. Uh, what you can do when you have a huge data file uh, is to actually uh, sample from it and build and evaluate your model uh, based on on a, a sample. Now, the sample could be very large, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, if you remember Stats 101, uh, really most of the tools that uh, we have grown up with in marketing research and other fields were designed for very small samples because data collection was very expensive. And so we're able to generalize to the population often from a very, sometimes it's, you know, a few hundred uh, uh, cases. But it's uh, perhaps more important than the size of the data itself is whether we have to predict or whether interpretation is more important to that, to us. A lot of uh, data mining and predictive analytics uh, is concerned really only with prediction, for example, estimating probability that a consumer will purchase a product or not. Now that's fine, but in, in marketing, uh, we often really uh, want to know more than that. We, need to know, we want to know why. Okay, why do certain consumers buy products, uh, certain brands, uh, or not shop a category at all, uh, and others do heavily? Uh, so if we have uh, some clues as to, you know, the why uh, consumers are behaving in certain ways and not in others, it's very valuable for us in, uh, in branding, in uh, creative development, in execution, and also in spotting opportunities for, for new products that are, are not on the market yet. Now, machine learning is uh, a term like big data that uh, has gotten a lot of press in recent years. 
uh, and uh, likewise it means different things uh, to different people. Essentially what, what they are, computer algorithms that are used for pattern recognition, for curve fitting, classification, clustering, stuff like that. Uh, the word learning in the term uh, comes from or uh, points to the uh, fact that the algorithms learn from data as they as they go along. Uh, the complication is though that machine learning uh, is there's no universally recognized definition of it that everybody would accept and very often uh, that term is used to refer to things like regression analysis or k-means cluster analysis and sorts of things that we're, we're fam very familiar with in, in marketing research, research, at least most of us. So when you hear the term machine learning, uh, if you do, and you're not really clear what uh, what is meant by it, just ask for specifics. I'd recommend you do that because uh, a lot of times it, there's, there just isn't very much congruence in the way it's used and, and it can't that can have a, a consequence. Okay, now, a moment ago I showed you about 12 different ways to, uh, to categorize analytics tools. Or, uh, you can actually coll collapse that in many cases into two, supervised methods and unsupervised methods. And supervised methods are used when there's a dependent variable, which is sometimes, sometimes called a label. Um, an example would be regression analysis or logistic re regression analysis where we're trying to predict something like, like purchase behavior or purchase interest from predictors. We have independent uh, variables that we use to try to predict uh, a dependent variable. Now unsupervised, unsupervised methods are used when there is no dependent variable. Uh, two examples of that would be uh, cluster analysis and factor analysis. So these are kind of like broad distinctions that uh, that we can also apply. Let's take a look at some popular supervised methods uh, quickly here. There's uh, something called generalized linear models, GLM, and there's a, a whole bunch of them. And they're extremely useful and versatile. They're used a lot uh, in conjoint and choice modeling, key driver things like that. Uh, and they can be used when the dependent variable is continuous, categorical, ordinal, count, repeat over time, or clustered. And by clustered, I mean, uh, as an example, departments within divisions of a company. Now, here are some other methods uh, that are used uh, in uh, data science and also in marketing research, but perhaps less so. I've listed uh, about five or six of the uh, the methods that are used most often. I think probably most of you have heard of artificial neural networks or neural nets. Uh, they've gotten a lot of press uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years or whatever. They're still very much with us and very useful. There are a whole bunch of other things. Uh, a couple of years ago, I saw an academic article that, uh, that the title was something like, do we we really need 171 classifiers. The, uh, the conclusion was uh, of the authors was uh, probably not. So there, there's a whole bunch of these things. Now these, the methods that I'm showing you here as opposed to GLM uh, are, uh, they tend to be newer. Uh, they are often, but not always, are better for data mining types of exercises where you just want to predict that you don't really need to explain. Uh, not always though. Uh, the downside is that they're very hard to interpret. It's very hard to get at the why, okay, or the how in any detail. They're kind of black boxy. So that puts them at a disadvantage sometimes with the, uh, compared to GLM. Fortunately, we're able to use, uh, in some cases, uh, different types of methods, one to predict and one to explain and learn about what consumers are really telling us by their behavior, by uh, their answers to survey questions, et cetera. Now let's move on very quickly to uh, give you a snapshot of some unsupervised methods. I think some of these uh, will be quite familiar to you. Uh, correspondence analysis is very widely used in mapping. It's useful a lot of times. I think you know, uh, you find out uh, from from your own work that big brands can dominate uh, a brand map. They score high on everything, and it's kind of boring. And correspondence is one correspondence analysis is one way to kind of reduce that 
brand size effect. It's not the only way, however. Uh, a lot of these, all of these can be can be used in mapping. Uh, correspondence analysis, biplots are perhaps the most important principal components analysis. Uh, is also uh, widely used for pre-processing data, say for example, uh, prior to cluster analysis uh, or regression analysis. Here's some more. Again, these are sort of uh, the, the newer techniques, not all of them. K-means and AHC you probably have heard of before, but there are, there are several others. Uh, the Kahuna networks are really kind of a, a neural network. Uh, frequent pattern mining is used in market basket analysis and for recommender systems. Mixture modeling and latent class. Latent class is really, uh, uh, some of you may have heard of that. Uh, it's really a kind of like a, a subsidiary or a kind of mixture modeling. And mixture modeling is a very uh, interesting, useful tools. It's quite complicated, but it can also accommodate uh, dependent variables. So you can use it a lot. Uh, there's actually a GLM uh, version to it, and it can be estimated with Bayes, too. Structural equation modeling, SEM, has been around for a while. Uh, it kind of comes and goes, and uh, I'm a big fan of it. Uh, there are detractors of it. It can be quite easy to misunderstand and to misapply. Uh, overall, of the techniques I've mentioned so far, it's uh, perhaps the most versatile of the, of the bunch. It, uh, it can unite the GLM sorts of things with factor analysis, so you can kind of get the both of the supervised and the unsupervised worlds combined. There's also a mixture modeling variant of it called structural equation mixture modeling. It adds in cluster analysis to it. It can be used for longitudinal or clustered data. By clustered here, I mean multi-level or longitudinal data. There's uh, uh, another method called partial least squares, PLS, uh, which is also quite popular, sort of a, a rival, if you will, to, to SCM. I use them both, uh, SCM perhaps uh, a bit more often. Now, time in uh, some kinds of research is an important dimension uh, that kind of makes it difficult for us to to use a lot of the methods that we're we're familiar with, like our standard regression. A time series analysis is really a very large group of methods that originated in different fields such as econometrics, statistics, operations research, and engineering. It's used when data have been collected at many points in time, uh, one example being weekly sales in a marketing research context. Accordingly, it's uh, used a lot for things like sales forecasting and marketing mix modeling, which is also known as market uh, response modeling. In marketing mixed modeling, market response modeling, what we're trying to do is we're, we're correlating, for example, sales uh, statistics with marketing inputs to try to figure out where we're getting the most bang for buck. Uh, very tricky stuff, uh, and I wouldn't try it uh, at home. Uh, it's a specialized uh, branch within marketing uh, research and, and other disciplines. Really cool stuff, really, really useful. It tells a lot of clients what they really need to know, but uh, it's easy to get wrong. Uh, here's uh, just a few of the uh, the techniques. Some of these you may have, uh, have heard of. Uh, they, they like to use a lot of acronyms, particularly in econometrics, like ARIMA, autoregressive, integrated moving average is what that stands for. So there's a Quite a quite a, a whole bunch of these things, and they're specialized software. And I personally know uh, three or four people who have PhDs in in this kind of stuff. So it's uh, it's quite specialized, but again, very useful. There's also something called time to event modeling uh, that goes under different names, such as survival analysis, duration analysis, or event history analysis. And you use it when you're analyzing or want to analyze the expected time until one or more events happens. Uh, a couple of uh, marketing research applications would include when we want to try to find out what factors cause customer churn, 
for predicting how long a customer will remain that it survive as a customer and for analysis of purchase behavior and website usage. So those are just three of many applications that it can be uh, used for in marketing research. It's quite complex as you might imagine. It may be completely new to many or, or all of you. Um, it's heavily used by medical researchers, by economists, by engineers, and in operations research and uh, in, in increasingly in marketing research. It's Kaplan, Meyer, Cox regression, parametric models are the main methods of the variations of that, including segmentation. So you don't have to have one model uh, to try to, you know, fit one uh, model into into one shoe and ignores how different customers are are different. Okay, so this sounds kind of uh, complicated probably to a lot of you. There's a lot of stuff, and I've only just uh, touched on uh, on some of the the techniques that uh, that I use and many others. And there are lots of others that I've never heard of. So, you know, why why bother with this? Uh, it seems like a hassle. Well, one reason is it adds value to data. It can help data speak to us. For example, we can take respondent scale usage patterns and background characteristics into account. And that will provide us with a deeper understanding and a more accurate understanding of attitudes and behaviors and how they connect. And that actually isn't done very much in, in marketing research. Another reason is that appearances can be deceiving. In any kind of research, the totals and cross tabs only show us the surface. They're just really the, the first steps in exploratory data analysis. Also, and this is very important, running lots of cross tabs to try to find something interesting. Okay, all clients always want to hear something interesting from us. That increases the risk, however, of fluke findings. And clients can make bad decisions based on results which are really just uh, a result of chance. Looking at variables one at a time can also uh, kind of distort your, your picture. Uh, getting back to our, our first uh, presentation uh, this afternoon, I was, I was thinking of that uh, while, while watching that. Uh, for example, older consumers may seem to be heavier users of a particular product category, but when we drill down and do a little bit of modeling and take things like gender, income, and other characteristics into account, we may find that category act usage actually declines with age. So again, this is an example of why we use advanced analytics, because appearances can be deceiving. Now, I've just shown you some of the tools the marketing scientists may wish to include in their toolbox. Uh, more important, though, much more important, though, than the tools is how they're actually used. Making advanced analytics work involves much more than math and programming and to uh, paraphrase Hippocrates, you need to put the patient before the cure. A change has been mentioned uh, many, many times uh, already today. Uh, no one really knows what things are going to be like in five years uh, or ten years or certainly fifteen years or further, further on. Things like the Internet of Things Artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and unforeseen innovations will likely have a profound impact on our lives in the future. And if they do so, that means they will also impact on marketing research and, and analytics, uh, not just our, our personal lives. So some kinds of analytics, I think, uh, will be largely automated in the not-so-distant future, though human judgment will remain essential. Further ahead, well, who knows? Marketing and marketing research may be extensively automated. But I wonder, in that sort of world, will they still even be necessary? Thank you very much.